So we're going to be talking about uh, applied partial differential equations. Um, the book we will be using is um, J. David Logan, Applied Partial Differential Equations. This is an undergraduate textbook for an introduction to partial differential equations. To begin with, we're gonna first look into kind of what a ODE is and what the form looks like and how that differs from a partial differential equation. For example, in population ecology, we have an evolution equation as du dr dt is equal to ru times one minus u over k t greater than zero. Where r, where r is the relative growth rate U is U of T is the population of a system of individuals. K is the carrying capacity. In this equation, this is the ODE, an ordinary differential equation. And it, when it is solved, we get some evolution equation, which is U of T equal to U naught K over U naught plus K minus mu naught U naught E to the negative RT. So that's what an ODE is. But in a partial differential equation, we have not just spatial things changing, but space and time changing. And so sometimes one variable will be changing and one will be held constant. And that's why we have what we call partial differential equations. So we'll introduce PDEs with the example from our book. And this is going to be governed by heat flow. So heat flow, we can say that we have some bar. And at the ends of each bar, U of zero T is equal to zero degrees. So U being the temperature and U of L T equal to zero degrees as well. We can say that this is the x-axis, and this is 0, this is L, and this is the x-axis. And then we'll take some cross-section, and we'll say that u is equal to u of xt. And this is an insulated bar, also lateral bar. So. We know that the heat equation is U partial U of T is equal to K double partial of U with respect to X. And we know that K is the diffusivity. Now, in this case, we're going to say that K is a constant but k can be a function of other variables as well. So we want to know how does this bar cool? That's our question that we want to answer. And we can say, or we, we know that we have this bar which is u equal to u of x t. And we know that at the boundaries that u of zero t is equal to zero degrees Kelvin or zero degrees and um, the u on the right at l, u of l t is equal to zero as well. So u of x t where 
T is time. So U is the temperature with respect to space and time. And this is for all X on zero to L. Our boundary conditions, so these will be our boundary conditions. This will be a boundary condition. That will be a boundary condition. And so we say that in written terms, zero, U of zero T equal to zero and U of L T is equal to zero. We're all T greater than zero. That is our boundary conditions for this example. And then we can say, we know it has a fixed temperature phi of x. So that will be our initial condition, how it is governed with respect to time. Um, and so u of x zero is phi of x for all x on L. So that's what we have. We have our now these are these are the character properties that we will need and, and information we'll need to kind of solve and start to unravel what what the solution for a partial differential equation. And so you need to define your boundary conditions and incorporate your initial conditions as it is stated for the physical system. Moving along, we have, we're gonna kind of go along with this idea of um, the heat flow model and we're kind of going to expand a little bit, kind of bring up other important aspects of the heat flow model. So again, just re rehamping. Here we have in the, so in the heat flow model, we have some bar. And this is zero and this is zero as well. This is some crystal cross section um, U of XT. Okay. We call this type of model an evolution model. And when these models are invariant with respect to time, we call them steady state or equilibrium models. And so one of the more, more famous equations that we, that many physicists are aware of um, and mathematicians is Laplace's equation. So we're gonna expand this and look further into Laplace's equation. And this kind of will allow us to understand this steady state concept, Laplace's equation, which we know to be partial derivative of u, Double partial derivative, the double partial derivative of u with respect to x, and then double partial derivative of t with respect to, or u with respect to t. And the sum of those is equal to zero for all x, y that are elements we'll make up. So here we'll kind of shift gears a little bit, but kind of go along the same idea of this heat flow model. So we have some 2D surface. And this 2D surface, we're going to call omega. Now on that 2D surface, we have some differential partial virtual, um, element, and we call that the omega. And so this element is 
can be further understood as um, as invariant on the boundary, so not changing on the boundary. And so um, basically we can say, we can call this function out, this function u of x, y, g of x, y. So that function g of x, y describes the invariance along the invariant around, variance along the, the, um, the 2D space. And so we say g of x, y for every x, y that are elements of partial omega. So that's kind of how we can kind of conceptualize this type of problem. And specifically, this problem in itself, where we have a constant along the boundary, is called the dialect problem. It's very famous. So furthermore about, about partial differential equations is that Partial differential equations, as you see here, denoted um, use of xx and use of tt. These use of xx are really just partial squared u with respect to x squared. And u sub t t is equal to partial squared u of partial t squared. And so what this is, is it's double the double second derivative of the of u with respect to x. And these partial derivatives have power. So this would be second order, right? So we have orders of PDEs. And an order of a PDE, so a partial differential equation, so this, an order of an equation like this would be governed by the highest order of, highest order of the partial deriv derivative in this equation. So if there was like a, third, like an, an order of three, then then your, your order of that partial differential equation would be three. So the order of PDEs is the highest partial derivative in the PDE. PDEs can be further classified though. And they can be classified by their linearity or nonlinearity. Linearity is defined as a linear or a linear PDE, I guess. Linear, we can just kind of PDE is defined as when you have an unknown parameter, let's just say x, and the derivatives are all to the first power. Otherwise, it's nonlinear. Nonlinear and linear can be further classified into homogeneous and non homogeneous. A homogeneous a homogeneous linear equation or homogeneous, it doesn't necessarily have to be linear, is when every term is or contains that unknown parameter x or some derivative of it. And then non-homogeneous is when every term depends only on their respective independent variables. So that's the short synopsis there. So we're gonna, now we're gonna look at another example from the book and we're gonna look at a second order equation. So we can look at these different orders. So as I was talking about earlier, we have, say we have ut 
plus u sub x, x is equal to zero and u sub t, t minus u sub x plus sine of u is equal to zero. This is non-linear because this first product here has the order of two. And this here is, this is non-linear as well because the sine, sine is a non-linear function. And so that makes, so these two are both non-linear cases. And then we have, so that's one example. Maybe we have two. The second example, we could say maybe u sub t minus sine of x squared t, u sub x t is equal to zero. Well, every function, every term is or contains some u sub t or some derivative of x, of, of that t. So we can say that that's linear and it's homogeneous because it's equal to zero. So that's, that, that gives us linear homogeneous here. So this is linear homogeneous. And then we have a third example. So u sub t plus three x u sub x x is equal to t x squared. Well, we know from the start, it's definitely not homogeneous. So we can say that's not homogeneous. But then we can look at the powers of the orders of these, and we see that that's linear. Um, each of these have uh, powers equal to, each of these, each term is or contains x or some, or u sub t or some, some derivative of x, of that t. So, that's why that's linear. Furthermore, we can look at other aspects of partial, partial differential equations, which allow for convenience. And we use operator notation for convenience. One example of this is the L differential operator. We can write, for example, the heat equation, or not the heat equation, yeah, the heat equation um, as this. But we can also write an operator notation as L u equal to zero, where L is partial of partial t minus k partial squared of partial x squared. A reminder, the k is the, where k is the diffusivity. And by mathematical formalism, we can say that it acts that, that it's acting twice continuously differentiable functions to produce a new function. So if we can say that L is a linear different differential operator if and only if you can have the sum the sum of the two functions are also a solution or constant multiple if they are governed by these two properties. Now, if L of u, the differential operator acting on u, is equal to zero, then it is called homogeneous. If L of u is equal to some function, it's not homogeneous. But in the linear equations, we have algebraic structure to their solutions. So the sum of the two solutions is, in fact, a solution. This is in linear algebra, recall. And this and the constant multiple times the solution will also give you another solution. That's only if it is linear. 
And we would also say see that we would have this also linear combination and superposition principle that would fall under these linear conditions. And so we can look, for example, at u of x t to c is a one parameter family of solutions to to L u equal to zero. So that's the homogeneous solution or equation. And then we can, for all C in an interval J, for all C that are elements of J, we prove that integrating over J for C of C, so this is the constant multiple. So this is the superposition principle. So superposition principle, we can prove this, that constant multiple of, of the solution is also another solution. And the sum of those solutions is also another solution. But we'll see that because recall that a integral is really a limit of sums. So summing C1, U1 plus C2, U2 plus C3, U3 plus dot, dot, dot. All of those, if you sum over all of those, that's the limit limit of that sum will give us this integral. And we will prove that it is in fact the super position principle. We also see this with complex valued functions as well. We can characterize partial differential equations by the or by by the physical makeup and algebraic structure in the partial differential equations. And we can see that PDEs generally have, can be generally classified as wave-like, diffuse-like, or equilibrium, we, that we call that the steady state, remember? So those are the types of models we shall see and some types of processes that we'll, we can understand. Recall that the Laplace's equation is a second order linear equilibrium equation. The heat equation is a second order linear diffusion equation because heat flow is a diffusion process. And um, when we discuss about a solution of a PDE, we really mean a function u equal to u of x t defined on a space-time domain. So it's x, y, z, and t, right? So it's an evolution model. And a solution to a second order equation should have two continuous partial differential equations. So partial derivatives so that it makes sense to calculate the derivatives and substitute them into the equation. Whereas the general solution to an ODE involves an arbitrary constants. The general solution for a PDE involves arbitrary functions. So when you integrate over a variable such as t, then you end up with an arbitrary function with respect to x. Because you've integrated over t, you still have a function of x. So you end up with some arbitrary function. Sometimes this general solution to a PDE can be found, but it's not necessarily to have it 
solve for most of our problems here. So that's kind of looking looking at the full scope of things. And then we can do another um, another example uh, from the book and we could say, um, I don't know if I want to do that one. Yeah. So key thing that I'm going to rehab is so that I want to cover is that I guess we can do example 1.4 because this will kind of harp that, that that aspect into this is that about how when you integrate over a variable, you end up with a, an arbitrary function. So let's well, given that we have ux equal to t sine of x. Um, we can solve this by direct integration, kind of like we did with some of the separation by variables in ODEs. We kind of do something similar here and we integrate over this equation. But instead of a constant, if you integrate over both sides of these equations, say we have the x and whatnot, yeah, dt, whatever, dx, whatever. When you do that, um, you essentially get u of x t is then negative t because the integral of if we're just going over dx, then we end up that's t is a constant. You could pull that out. Then root up sine, integral of sine is co negative cosine of x. And then we end up with plus because this is normally we, we in, in separation of variables, we would have like a plus c. But instead of a constant, because this is a partial differential equation, we end up with some arbitrary function that, that's a function of t because t is not really a constant. It's just that we're not integrating over it. It's a, it's a constant with respect to our own, when we're only integrating over with x. Um, and so we add the arbitrary function, psi of t. And so that's what we mean when that's, this is in one of the major differences between um, ODEs and PDEs that we have. And that's because of the way that these equations are governed. <clears throat> um, and so that would be a lot of the PDEs are have arbitrary functions and the expression for their general solutions. So a lot of general solutions will have psi of t. Now, if you're given other conditions, then you can actually, you can begin to solve for these arbitrary functions if you have some other information about the physical system. Um, and so that's that's kind of of importance. And I think that's it for uh, section 1.1. 1. 1.